At the beginning of this series, I noted how the first book of the Bible is Genesis and how within the first three chapters of this first book of the Bible, God starts explaining to us why there's pain and suffering in this world. He starts talking to us about the fall. And I noted that God's prioritization of this issue tells us that he knew that suffering was going to be our biggest question in this life and therefore he made it a matter of the utmost urgency to speak to us about it right away. It's right there at the very beginning of the very first book of the Bible. Genesis isn't the oldest book of the Bible, however. Sequentially, it's the first, but the oldest book of the Bible, in that it was the first one to be committed to parchment, is generally thought by scholars to be the book of Job. Actually, because of its age, the book of Job is a difficult one to date accurately, but it's mostly placed somewhere between the 4th and 7th centuries BC. Most likely it was written down somewhere around 6 BC, which I find astonishing really, they were able to read the words of a perfectly preserved piece of literature that's around 8,000 years old. That's absolutely mind-boggling. Now the theme of the book of Job is very interesting too, and it's very easy to summarize as well. The book of Job is a book about suffering. Specifically, it's a book that considers why bad things happen to good people who don't seem to deserve it. And of course, people today often ask this exact same question. Nothing's really changed here. People today often ask, why do bad things happen to good people? And I find this very interesting that both the first and the oldest books of the Bible primarily deal with this exact same theme of pain and suffering. And to me, it's further evidence that God knew that this would be our biggest question in this life. And so he prioritized it as the very first subject that he would talk to us about in his word. Therefore, it's worth us exploring the book of Job in the context of this series. Let's take a look. An interesting thing about Job is that it's written in poetry, and in fact, it appears to have originally been intended as a play. Indeed, it's believed that in the same way that William Shakespeare once wrote poetic plays based on real historical events and characters, that's what the book of Job is as well. It's based on a real life event, but it's been dramatized into Hebrew poetry, and very skillfully too. It's got to be said. The poet laureate Alfred Lord Tennyson once described it as the greatest poem of ancient or modern times. The French poet Victor Hugo once said, Tomorrow, if all literature was to be destroyed and it was left to me to retain one work only, I should save Job. Bear this in mind as we unpack Job's message. Now, at the beginning of the story, the Bible makes it absolutely clear that Job was a good man. It begins, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. If there was anyone who did not deserve to suffer in life, it was this man, Job. The Bible continues to set the scene by telling us that Job was very prosperous as well. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was in fact the richest person in that entire area. Now anyone reading this story so far would have had no problem whatsoever. We instinctively believe that good men should prosper and that evil men should suffer. Since Job is obviously a good man, it's easy for us to process the idea that he should be blessed with lots of material success. The shocking bit, however, is not long in coming because by the end of the first chapter, Job has already lost everything, all of it. His seven sons and three daughters are now dead, having been killed by raiders. The same raiders have also stolen all of Job's possessions and murdered his staff and his servants too. So his life is in complete ruins and he has nothing left in this world except for his wife. If that weren't bad enough, things soon deteriorate even further because by the end of the second chapter, his health has now been taken from him as well. And he's now suffering from some kind of putrid skin condition. He is covered in boils from head to foot. And as he sits in poverty in the dirt, he is reduced to using broken pottery shards to scrape his skin. Now, even though Job has been reduced to absolute ruins, he refuses to blame God 
for these circumstances. And this annoys his wife who, for her part, seems to have lost faith in God entirely at this point. She has the same problem as Epicurus. She can't accept the idea that a good and loving God would let such a tragedy befall them in their lives. Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? She says to Job, curse God and die. Job, however, for his part, remains absolutely steadfast. He knows that if he worships a God great and transcendent enough to be mad at because he hasn't stopped his suffering, then at that same moment, he has a God great and transcendent enough to have good reasons for allowing it to continue that he can't know. He replies, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? Now Job is thereafter visited by three friends who come to commiserate with him in his ruinous misery. The four men discuss Job's plight for the rest of the book and they throw some philosophical ideas around as to why God may have let such a disaster befall him. Now in the process of trying to figure things out here, the four men, Job and his three friends, assume a certain character in God. Firstly, in their discussions, they assume that God is good. And secondly, in their discussions, they assume that God is all powerful. After all, if God is not good, but is rather evil, then there's really no issue with Job's plight here because you would expect an evil God to make you suffer in life. There's, there's no problem to solve here. There's nothing to ponder. There's nothing to debate. The problem only arises if you assume that God is good because then you have to ask why a good God would allow all of this disaster. Similarly, if God is not all powerful but is rather weak, again, there would still be no problem to solve here. After all, you would expect a weak God to be impotent against the problems of life. You see, the problem of pain in Job's life only begins to become a problem if you assume these two character traits about God. Number one, that he is good, and number two, that he is all powerful. Now, does this ring a bell here? We're talking about the Epicurean trilemma here that we looked at and discussed in the introduction to this series. Remember, Epicurus said, is God able to prevent evil, but not willing? then he is not good. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able to? Then he is not all powerful. Is God both willing and able to prevent evil? Then why does evil exist? This is the question that Job and his three friends are wrestling with in the book of Job. Why is it that a good and all powerful God is allowing Job, this very righteous man, to suffer in this way? Now remember, Epicurus didn't pose his question until the third century BC. The book of Job was written anything up to 3,000 or 4,000 years before Epicurus was even born. This means that God was speaking to humans about this trilemma long before Epicurus, long before any atheist, any human being thought to raise it themselves. Indeed, 8,000 years before Stephen Fry fixed Gay Byrne with a steely gaze and raised the problem of pain, presuming he was saying something profound and unanswerable and something Christians had never thought of before and something that Christians must hide from or shirk and something the Christian worldview simply cannot consider or cope with. God had preempted him with the beginning of an answer a full eight millennia, 8,000 years ago. And this is why it can be so frustrating to listen to people like Stephen Fry and like my old school friends on social media and other atheists like them talk about suffering as though they are producing this insurmountable problem for the Christian faith. And it's that kind of checkmate tone in their voice that says, you haven't considered this, have you? Bone cancer in children, checkmate. You haven't considered that, have you? The Bible has no answer for this kind of thing, does it? God is silent in this kind of thing, isn't he? You have to run and hide from all of these questions if you're to retain your faith, mustn't you? Far from it. Not only does God refuse to hide or shirk this problem, but he confronts it as a matter of utmost priority. Not only does the Bible have something to say about pain, but it's the very first thing it has to say about anything. It's literally the first and the oldest topic in the entire Bible. God freely raised this question with us, with us human beings, long before any atheist, any human being thought to raise it themselves. Now you can choose to accept or reject the Bible's reasons, but let's not pretend that it doesn't have any. Let's not pretend that we are the first people in history to have a problem with suffering or to think these thoughts. Let's not pretend that it hasn't been wrestled with for thousands of years by people, most of whom were Christians until their dying day. And let's not pretend that the first person to talk about this stuff wasn't God himself. 
So what conclusion does the book of Job reach? How do the four men reason with this problem of a good, all-powerful God allowing bad things to happen to a righteous person? Well, in the book, I go into a bit more detail about this. I'm going to keep things a bit shorter in these videos. But basically, to summarize, the three friends offer a range of theories, but they mostly put forward a similar idea that Job must have some underlying sin in his life that God is judging him for. They all believe that if Job is truly righteous, he wouldn't be experienced experiencing all of this turmoil, that Job must deserve this in some way. Job doesn't accept this answer though, he keeps on batting these suggestions away. He knows that he's a righteous person and more importantly we know that he's a righteous person too. Remember the book opened by saying, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz, he was blameless, a man of complete integrity, he feared God and he stayed away from evil. So Job's right here, he was righteous. And even worse, he looks around at people around him who are far more wicked than him and asks why God doesn't punish them instead if it's based on wickedness. And we can empathise with Job here, I think. We know from personal experience that there are people in this world who try to do their best and yet suffer, and there are people in this world who do wicked things and yet who flourish and become successful. It all seems so random to us. Therefore, we know that this worldview being put forward by Job's friend doesn't quite satisfy. Bad things happen to good people too. It's not just a case that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people too. See how honest and transparent the Bible is about this stuff. There's no shirking, there's no hiding going on from the Word of God. It tackles these very difficult questions in a very open, honest and transparent way. Now, throughout the book of Job, he keeps on insisting on his innocence. He keeps on batting away this idea that he deserves this. And he demands that God speak with him directly on this issue. In fact, 36 times Job demands an explanation from God. Job essentially wants to put God in the dock and he's sure that if he could just do that, he would win the argument, he would win the debate against God. Now God eventually gives him his wish, he arrives in a storm, but instead of sitting in the dock to be questioned by Job as he would wish, he instead turns the tables and he asks Job some very specific questions of his own. God says, I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? God is emphasizing to Job just how little he understands from his lower vantage point. And that's just the beginning. God then continues to ask if Job knows how he created the earth and the seas. Does he know the scale of the planet? Does Job know where light comes from? Does he know where all the springs of the earth are? Does Job know the depth of the ocean? Can he control the weather? Does he know how many stars there are? Does he understand the physics of how those stars move? Job suddenly begins to feel very small and impertinent for believing that this God who created all of this should have to explain himself. God continues, however, he asks Job if he can understand his creation, how he made the animals, goats, deer, donkeys, oxen, ostriches, horses, hawks and eagles. Does he know how all of these animals were made? Should the God who made all of these things not have reasons that human beings simply can't understand? God challenges Job saying, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Job is duly humbled by this realization of who God is and who he is by comparison. He says, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. Job arrives at the same conclusion that we reached at the end of the previous video in this series. If you have a God great and transcendent enough to be mad at because he hasn't stopped the evil and suffering in the world, then you have at that same moment a God great and transcendent enough to have good reasons for allowing it to continue that you can't know. Indeed, you can't have it both ways. Job now understands that there may be reasons that he doesn't know about and he closes his mouth. Indeed, just because he doesn't understand the reasons, it doesn't mean that there are no reasons. God is much bigger and much wiser than him beyond all measure. Now, after being humbled by this encounter with God and being refined by his time of suffering, God then lavishes Job with blessings once again. Indeed, he doubles the material wealth that he enjoyed before 
all of his troubles began. The book ends by saying the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Then he died an old man who had lived a long, full life. Ultimately, we all need to come to this place that Job reached. Even though we don't understand the reasons for some suffering, it doesn't mean that there are no reasons or that there can't be any reasons. We need some humility here before a God who is much, much bigger and much wiser than we can even comprehend. Rather than cursing God for our troubles as Job's wife encouraged, surely it would be better if we had some faith in this massive God and in his ways and in his omniscience. Remember, we have the promises that there is a point to all of this. We have the promises that a better future does lie ahead for us. And we have the promises that one day all of this will become clear. Until that day, God simply asks us to have some faith.